Welcome to the Summit for Wellness podcast, where we help you climb to the peak of your health. And now, here is your host, Brian Carroll. One year ago, when the world was shutting down, I decided to try my hand at beekeeping. Since we hear about how the bees are dying and how that can impact our ecosystem and food system, I figured it would be a good way to support my local area. Little did I know that there is so much more to beekeeping than just getting a hive and letting it do its thing. And I also didn't know that honeybees are not a local species to North America. What's up everyone, I'm Brian Carroll and I'm here to help people move more, eat well, and be adventurous. And today, we have a little bit of a different episode than normal. Entomologist Danny Nahara is joining me to talk about how important insects are to the ecosystem and what we can do to improve our local gardens and areas to be supportive to these creatures. Now, this isn't a creepy crawly type of episode. There's lots of fascinating information in this show. It's almost like listening to a National Geographic show, but in audio format. So let's get into my conversation with Danny. Danny Nahara grew up in a military family living mostly on the West Coast and the Midwest. He spent a good amount of time camping when younger and fell in love with the natural world. His interest in animal behavior led him to the University of Kansas, where he received a PhD in entomology studying honeybee cognition. His two boys come out on adventures in nature and know more than they think they do about the natural world around them as a result. Thank you for coming onto the show, Danny. Awesome. Happy to be here. And I'm curious, if you went from the West Coast and you were living around the West Coast, what drew you to Kansas to study uh, nature and entomology? Well, with my dad being in the military, I didn't have a choice of where I lived. But eventually, my brother lived there, and it was time for me to leave my parents. So I moved to Kansas to kind of hang out with my brother, help him out. And I was like, hey, you know, there's colleges, there's universities. Went to Allen County Community College, finished up at the University of Kansas with my bachelor's, but met a professor there that clearly was for me and uh, stayed for the PhD. And what is it about entomology that just excites you so much? Probably the coolest thing about entomology for me, uh, since I'm an evolutionary minded person, is that there's probably more evolutionary evidence slash observations in insects because there's so many you know, million plus species of insects that uh, they've tried virtually every way you can build an insect or pretty much any animal. And it's just a matter of looking. And, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, you take a sweep net into the bushes and you're probably going to see something you haven't seen before or something that's going to be completely strange. And there's just never an end to the diversity and so curiosity reigns forever. Yeah, so a fun fact about me, when I was younger, I really wanted to become an entomologist. And uh, my plan was to go and study down in the Amazon. Obviously, that didn't pan out. But have you done any work down in the Amazon by chance? No, my studies in entomology were less about diversity, actually. So the class is taught about diversity. But unlike a lot of my colleagues, which were doing systematics, taxonomy, they would go into the South American continent all over the place and collect, you know, who knows what, and name a bunch of new species. But I was, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say stuck in a bad way, but I was stuck in the fields in, um, in Kansas looking at the honeybee's behavior. So I was more on the behavioral end of those things. Is there an estimate how many uh, insects are on the earth? The estimates when I was in college uh, studying entomology was just under a million species. Now I think it's about 1.3 million species of insects with probably five to 10 million in terms of the conservative estimates in terms of what we'll find when we're sort of done, I guess. Although from the evolutionary perspective, there's never a done point, right? Things are constantly in flux. Right. Right. And it's kind of interesting because a lot of people are um, feel fearful or grossed out by insects. However, they do have some important roles in the ecosystem of the world. So what are some of the common roles of insects with our ecosystem? Well, I think when you think about insects, obviously, I think they're gorgeous. Some people don't. But when it comes to the ecosystem, one of the most important things is like any animal, they do consumption. They eat other forms of life. That could be eating plants. That could be eating dead material. That could be eating live other animals. So the processing of matter and the cycling of nutrients and energy is huge. 
Uh, I remember learning a statistic that in most ecosystems, if you removed just the insects like termites and ants, within a month, there'd be about an inch worth of dead things on the floor that weren't processed. And another way to think about this is whenever you're out in the ecosystem, and it's less common in the Pacific Northwest, but many of the ecosystems of the planet, um, the ants, the termites, they basically walk every single inch of the ecosystem every single day. Uh, every tree, every branch, every piece of dirt, they're just absolutely everywhere. So it's pretty impressive. They're kind of like stewards of the ecosystems in some respect. And then the other thing that I remember learning was when you learn about insects, you really look at an ecosystem and that's what the insects have chosen not to eat because they're so numerous, they really could just wipe everything out. Um, and we see things like, you know, the locust swarms across the world that just completely ravage. And they have this great, amazing balance of doing exactly what they need to do without going a little bit overboard. And so again, you know, the number of moths that are eating leaves, the number of ants that are chewing on this and that, it's all sort of balanced out in a very complex way uh, to leave the ecosystems in balance. Pretty cool. That is super interesting. Um, and speaking of like locusts going through and destroying a bunch of crops, there is a lot of pesticide use on crops nowadays. Um, is that impacting insects as a whole on the planet, or is it more localized to those areas that are utilizing the pesticides? Yeah, pesticides play a huge role in insect numbers. However, there's two really important perspectives to view the pesticide idea. And the reason is, I tell a lot of my environmental science students, we've been using pesticides for over 100 years now, and they're still here. So in one respect, it isn't affecting some of population, some have become resistant. And that's expected from, you know, a hyper diverse type of organism that mates and reproduces really fast, right, to, to form resistance. But there are also those kinds of insects that are not super fast reproducers. And those are the ones that are getting really knocked back because a lot of the pesticides, unfortunately, are not target specific. And they get in the water and then they get in the rivers and they go out to the coast uh, and cause lots and lots of problems, not just with insects, but definitely insect numbers uh, diversity wise are lower. Uh, those that can handle the pesticide, they go absolutely nuts in terms of their population. So it's kind of not bad for those good ones that can handle it and really bad for those ones that can't handle it. Oh, uh, so what are some insects that have a hard time handling it? Some of the most susceptible would be things like mayflies, a lot of the water-based organisms, a lot of the water-based insects where the larvae have to you know, germinate or uh, go through their reproduction in the water because a little bit in the water really affects every single cell as opposed to ingestion through the mouth, which can be isolated in the body. So uh, that would be the one I would say is most affected. And then obviously there's some of the ones on the crops that are targeted that uh, the pesticides do do a good job on. So a lot of caterpillars, things like that. That's uh, interesting that you mentioned that a little bit in the water can uh, cause so much damage because a lot of times... Um... Uh, people say the solution to pollution is dilution, and they say uh, stuff getting into the water, you know, it, it gets so diluted that it's not a big deal, but it can be um, for a certain species. Is that what you're saying? No, you're absolutely right. Um, one of the solutions for pesticide is dilution, and water is an amazing diluter. The, the big issue with what happens in the ecosystem is when you're talking about a river and pesticide use, you're talking about the pesticide use over major acreage in the entire watershed that then condenses into a small creek stream river. So unfortunately, um, the acreage of the watershed, you think about the Great Plains, basically all dumping into the Mississippi River. It's, it's overwhelming, unfortunately. Interesting. So yeah, you might not want to live anywhere near those uh, water sources or drink from them. Um, so you, you had mentioned that uh, as we start discovering more species, we're adding to that number. We're around like 1.3 million species that we know of, but there's also um, loss that's happening within the species as well. Is there a, an estimate of how much loss we've had in the last few decades? Yeah, there's been some really interesting papers about loss of biodiversity in general. Um, people have looked at overall population sizes and I think the estimate is in the last few decades, we've probably lost just population size, not species, like 30, 40% of animals, which is not awesome. 
when you're looking at insects, it's difficult because since we expect right now, let's say there's 5 million insects max, just as a conservative estimate. If we know 1.3 now, that means there's, you know, 3.7 we don't know. So what are their numbers doing? We have no idea. For the 1.3 we know, we're probably monitoring less than 0.1. And so it's really difficult to kind of understand. But overall, if you're looking at the species of insects in the last couple of decades, it is definitely going down. And all it really takes is asking some of the old timers about driving their car at night and how much bug they would have to clean off their car. And now you just don't have that quite as much. Um, people look at soil systems near rivers and the total number of, you know, macro invertebrates, micro invertebrates, soil organisms, in, you know, invertebrates in general, and it's down. People look at um, butterfly species, those are down. Bumblebees, people keep saying, you know, I don't see as many. We've got a couple locally that were thought to be extinct because they're just numbers are dwindling and we see one or two here and there. So I think more or less, besides those insects that are finding a way to resist the pesticides and other influences, uh, most of them are really getting hit. So diversity is dropping. And then of course, there's the, the bigger major trend of some people saying that species counts are dropping so drastically right now. Uh, and this includes insects that we're in this so-called sixth extinction event, massive extinction event on the planet. And unfortunately it does look that way. The data is pretty convincing. And what's really different about this potential sixth extinction event is that unlike the other five, those were caused more or less by events that happened and then stopped really quickly. Um, what's causing this current one is likely human impact and that is not stopping. And so it's persistent, it's becoming more magnified and more intense. And so we'll begin to see more, more loss, uh, probably sooner than we'll see gain, unfortunately. Yeah, which is sad that we're having that much impact on the planet. Um, now, for animals, when animals species are starting to die off, they get put onto like an endangered species list. Are there lists like that for insects as well? And if so, is there any type of uh, program or anything to try and reestablish some of these endangered species? Yeah, the insects have just as much uh, uh, option or opportunity to be on these lists. But again, since we don't study them as much and there's fewer people studying them and there's less overall attention to conservation of insects, the proportion is just completely uh, not in the, the favor of insects. So if you look at some of the listings of you know endangered species, you know the mammals have a huge percentage. I think some of them, in certain areas are 60 to 80% um, for their, you know, groupings. And the insects are like less than 1%, you know, if you try and make it, make it equivalent. So it's really hard. There is one really amazing group that I'm aware of, the Xerces Society. That's X-E-R-C-E-S Society. That is basically all about invertebrate conservation. And they have to take really strange um, viewpoints because if you just say this random bug that a lot of people would just step on needs our protection. It's hard to get funding. It's hard to get attention. So they're looking at it more from a, you know, landscape point of view or beneficial insects kind of point of view, and then lumping other critters in there with those, you know, save the, save the landscape plan in order to save other species. And a lot of people are seeing that saving a species is less effective than saving their habitat. So the, the die is cast, you know, insects are struggling. There are some people trying to promote the conservation of them, but it's going to be landscape level, probably more than the, the individual insect species level. So uh, if you're trying to save populations of insects, is it better to focus on the native insects for that localized area? Or is it better to focus on species that uh, perform similar um, roles within the ecosystem? That is a very great question. So insects move around a lot and we don't know again, from we just don't have the studies to say how much. So when you have a choice between conserving a native insect or an insect that basically replaces the function of that insect, we, we pretty much always want to have the native insect. Sometimes that's difficult for a variety of reasons and specific reasons. But the reason why is because Whenever we look at an organism and we favor one or two things for what it does, um, a specific ecosystem interaction, we're missing a, a whole bunch of other stuff we never even studied. 
So we don't know what the ramifications are of potentially, let's say, 100 different interactions of the ecosystem we like for. So we put that thing in and see what happens. Sometimes it goes in our favor. Sometimes it starts doing other things. Um, so the native species, they have at least been through something resembling a checkpoint. They have buffers within to make sure that they're stable across all of their interactions at some level. So always be favoring the natives but sometimes you just need that ecosystem function. And it's a difficult question to answer when it comes to very specific questions. And, you know, insect people, agricultural people, Department of Natural Resources, they all sit at the table and try and hash this out. And it's never easy, never, never easy. Yeah, which uh, leads us into the next section I want to cover because I learned from you about a year ago that uh, honeybees are not native. And yet a lot of us... Um, get honeybees because we think, oh, it's helping with pollination and all that type of stuff. But it might not be the best if you're just trying to focus on reestablishing uh, bee, the bee species overall. Um, so when it comes to honeybees, what what are some things we should know about their role in the local ecosystems and what things should be should we be cautious about? So the honeybee species to me is a very special species in a thousand different ways, but there's no mistaking it. It is absolutely not native to the new world, North and South America. And again, since we didn't have the studies now and we don't, we surely didn't have the studies then, we don't really know how much they've impacted the local species. What we do know is they will pollinate a lot of different things. And one of the things that we notice is honeybees prefer lots of different you know species out there and in our neighborhood that's not weed knapweed himalayan blackberry things like that they will hit other things as well and pollinate them for sure but unfortunately those three i just listed are pretty high on the noxious weed list and so it helps those species get their reproduction if you watch a patch of flowers that both honeybees and other native bees are flying and pollinating for sure, the general reaction is honeybees are very docile. So a bumblebee will just beat up a little honeybee and push it out of the way. Say, these are my flowers. And the honey will be, honeybee will just say, all right, my fault. I'm sorry. Let me get out of your way. And then once the bumblebee is gone, it will return. So in terms of individual interactions, the honeybees seem to get pushed out. But when the bumblebee goes away, you've got 10 honeybees that are going to be there in its place. So it's really difficult to understand how much volume of nectar and resource is moving around the landscape due to honeybees and how much you know, resource, if one of the native pl uh, plants needs to be pollinated by non-honeybees, if the honeybee is taking all the nectar, the native bee doesn't go to the flower as much and that could hurt potentially the pollination of that native plant. And again, these are all studies that need to be done, really, really hard to do to prove it's honeybees versus not. The best way to try and answer that question is to take it in the lab, but then in the lab is not the same. So it's very, very challenging. Um, in terms of their bigger role, there's no doubt humans and honeybees are linked at this point. Our systems of agriculture depend on them in a variety of ways. People have looked at alternative pollinators and there are options for some things, but there really isn't an option for a lot of other things. So I say that the honeybee species is very special because it is going to be in the middle of this, this idea, this conservation battle, this future that we look at. And I truly believe that it is going to be a flagship organism to helping move the pendulum back towards a more natural state of the world. And the reason why is because the bees, the honeybees, really support a lot of our human interaction, but it's still a natural interaction. Even though it's a non-native species, it's that function of pollination. So we've got to understand and we can use these honeybees to show and demonstrate that you know, no computer code, Microsoft's cool, Amazon's cool, Instagram's cool, but all of the things that they do, they've never actually produced a piece of food for us, right? So the next time we take our bite of an apple, good old Washington apple state, right? We have to realize that nothing that humans have constructed have made that apple. It was cells, it was bees, it was pollen, and it was organisms that allowed that to happen. We may have planted the plants in a specific area. We may have moved the bees near them, but it is other species that we fundamentally rely on in order to have basic sustenance, things that you can't live without. So that's a huge thing. And as we understand that relationship with the honeybee, hopefully we can get it to spread out to all the other species as well. 
Yeah, it's interesting. Last year I had honeybees for the first time, and I don't know if it's because I was paying attention more um, or what, but I noticed way more bumblebees in my yard than I've ever noticed before. And so I don't know how that works, or like I said, maybe I'm just paying more attention to it. I don't know. No, for sure. Especially the flowers. Like after you keep bees a couple years, you're going to notice flowers and how they interact with your bees. And then you're going to buy flower guides. And then you're going to buy bug guides and butterfly guides. <laughs> One thing leads to another. So it definitely is a more of awareness, right? So when you start looking at things that fly, instead of saying, oh, no, is it going to sting me? You say, oh, what kind of bee is that? Uh, when you get honeybees, for sure, for sure. So now that um, spring is pretty much here at this point, uh, a lot of people want to start looking into um, getting honeybees and seeing what it's like to actually have their own bees. Um, and is it better to order bees from like the big national suppliers that are out there? Or is it better to try and find someone local that's able to split their hive and give you um, uh, maybe a, a hive that's been able to withstand the weather that is more local to the area that you're at? Well, I will always say local is better for a thousand different reasons. And I think COVID has shown us that, you know, traveling can be dangerous to a lot of health disease can spread when you're moving bees all over the country. So get to stuff local. There is definitely the tendency for local bees to have a slightly better local tendencies, especially if they've overwintered. Uh, unfortunately for honeybees, if you keep those same bees year after year, they're probably going to be mating with other drones from who knows what colony. So a lot of those unfortunately wash out uh, in terms of those specific uh, circumstances that those bees are you know better at for this local region. Um, and I think sometimes beekeepers, new beekeepers, just want to have bees as soon as possible. And so they go with the big companies because they usually get them a little earlier than the local suppliers. But I think it's worth waiting for the local suppliers, um, again, because of those tendencies, but also just supporting the local local groupings. And maybe maybe if we don't ship too many things around the country, you know, diseases can be kind of, you know, held back a little bit. Uh, so there's those definite considerations. And then, of course, you're going to be paying for the, the, the cost for them to ship as well. Even if you don't pay the shipping yourself, at some point, the business is going to put that into their budget, right? Yep. Um, and speaking of diseases, uh, you're not talking about diseases amongst people. You're talking about uh, diseases amongst the bees. So are we in the insect realm? Do you see uh, more disease within species because of uh, being able to transport uh, these insects and species across a much greater distance than they naturally would? Or what's happening with the diseases there? Yes, definitely. So the statistic is something like 70% of the country's bees, honeybees, go down to almonds in, you know, beginning of the year, February, March-ish, and they all kind of pollinate those almonds and then they spread out. Now, there's definitely transmission that comes out of that. A lot of the companies will try and do medical treatments in order to minimize that. But you basically condense a bunch of bees, they share diseases, and then you spread them out all over the country. And if I were a disease, I would love that as an option <laughs> in order to spread around because that doesn't do the beekeeping um, you know, industry any favors, although the beekeeping industry is benefiting highly from all that trade and, and funding and you know money and all that that business kind of driven uh, aspect of it. So that's definitely good for bee business, but the bees themselves are going to vector a lot of those diseases. In terms of the disease issues right now, we have probably number one is the Varroa mite, and it is in an absolute catastrophic state right now, where the average value for most, especially backyard beekeepers, um, they have an above threshold average. And we've been calculating this average over the last five, six years at the college. And it's, it's kind of just overwhelming how easy this disease is to spread. Now, this mite is technically a pest, but they carry a variety of diseases in them. And as they chew on the bees, they vector those diseases to the bees. So it's really, really challenging to keep bees in this world. And I tell all the new beekeepers, you're a beekeeper and you're a mite keeper. So if you're going to get into bees, start planning ahead with respect to the bites. There is no shortage of information on the web about this. There are at least 14 different ways that you can deal with the mites for your bees. So it's a matter of animal husbandry at this point uh, of taking care of that. And again, 
we've got lots of options, chemical, non-chemical, uh, but it is another part of beekeeping that we're all kind of stuck with. If you get a chance to talk about old time beekeeping with someone that's kept bees in the 1960s, it's a very, very different game. So since uh, we're all pretty um, uh, accustomed to a pandemic or diseases spreading right now, can you uh, give a comparison of what is the mite issue like for bees, similar to the COVID issue that us humans are going through right now? This is a beautiful question. So I'm going to answer it in a very strange way. <laughs> Imagine. Okay, so if we want to compare how destructive uh, varroa mites are to bees compared to how destructive the mites are, or the COVID virus is to us, it would kind of be like if mosquitoes could vector COVID. And we were all living in the swamps of Southern Alabama <laughs> and going out to eat with everybody. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just, everyone's infected. Everyone is infected in the honeybee colony world. So right now COVID is killing, you know, a very small percentage of people. And, you know, in some States you have 10, 20% infection. When it comes to Varroa, we have 90% infection and 40%, 30% death. So this is 10 to 100 times worse, depending on the statistics in particular regions. If this Varroa was a human disease, nobody would fly, nobody would drive, nobody would take trains and planes. It would be a full-on quarantine. Delivery services, that's it. Uh, because again, everyone's got it. And with a, a, a death percentage in the 30s and 40s, this is this is full blown absolute catastrophe. This is this is like the plague, but airborne. And it's just it's 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 catastrophic. Perfect. I'm glad I asked that question because it's really good to put that type of stuff in perspective on just how big of an issue it is. But that shouldn't deter people from um, you know, getting some bees and trying it out, should it? No, absolutely not. And one of the great things is because the disease is one that's required to be that is required to be vectored, we can target the vector. There was some hope, and there might still be some hope that we could target what is being vectored. Unfortunately, from the mite, I think they've identified 50 different viruses that could be vectored. So it's not like we're going to vaccinate every colony against 50 different viruses or something along those numbers. And, you know, I'm sure those numbers have changed as more data has has come about. Um, but it's it's easier in this system to control the vector. So unfortunately for us, COVID, the vector is it's airborne. So you can't like not breathe. Right. You have to breathe, but you can get the mice off of the bees. And again, there's like, at least 14 different treatments. So as long as you get the knowledge, come up with a plan, execute the plan, um, you can keep those mite counts down pretty low. So um, if people are looking to get started with their own honeybees, uh, what are some quick tips that you could give them? And what are some ways that people can learn more um, about how to get started with honeybees? Probably the best tip if you're going to start with honeybees is start with two colonies. The reason is if one of them is not doing so hot, you can share resources and kind of help them help each other out. Um, if you just have one colony and it's not going so well, you have to watch it die and it's horrible. So just be mindful. Get two if it's within your budget. If it's not within your budget, you can go with one or wait till next year and put it in your budget. Uh, figure it out that way. The other thing is enjoy it. Really enjoy it. Inside of those boxes is arguably the most complex form of life on the planet. There is no end to what you will find in terms of satisfying your curiosity. If you like social species, if you're into complexity, if you want to learn about their cognitive skills, I mean, this thing is phenomenal in a thousand different ways. The genetics are off the charts. The social organization is off the charts. Their communication is literally off the charts. Um, they're potentially the second most complex form of communication known in the entire animal world. Obviously, human language is number one by far. but it's really a really special creature. And I, I brag that I can take a little observation colony to a kindergarten classroom or 900 level PhD class and teach from this single small box. I can take them to an old folks home. I can take them to a basketball court. This thing can show anyone some really, really amazing things. The other thing about getting started is 
have space. You're going to have boxes. You're going to have frames. And it's going to get more than you expect initially. Things are nasty and sticky and honey gets everywhere. So be very mindful about that. Don't put this stuff on carpet. It's going to ruin your carpet. Have a nice shed area that stays relatively dry. But ultimately enjoy it because it is really, you know, if you've ever had any other pet, dog, cat, whatever, it's a different kind of thing entirely but it's so much more complex and it's hard to, hard to imagine that at first, but I think for beekeepers, once you really start to learn about what's going on, you spend time inside the colony, things are constantly changing and just, it's really impressive. Yep. And I would recommend too, and I don't know how you feel about this, but uh, you could sit there and read every little thing on the internet on how to have the best beehives. Uh, but that's not the same as actually getting a hive and, working through this stuff because every single hive is going to be different and you're going to learn so much more by actually doing than just by reading itself. Um, and it seems like every week you're pivoting and learning something new about the hive. So it's better to just get your hands dirty and get started with it. There's no doubt about that. And, you know, we offer classes, lecture classes to kind of get you going, but, uh, we also offer hands-on, we call it beekeeper for a day. And this is through bees in the burbs in Maple Valley where we have to do something. We're responding to the flowers. A lot of beginning beekeepers don't know what to do. So we say, come help us work these hives. We'll, we'll all learn together. You can work four or five hives. You learn on what to look for, how to, how to do what you need to do with respect to what you see. You go home with your bees. And you go home with two of your bees and then do the same things. So you're getting that, that expert knowledge. You're getting the experience. And if you make a mistake, it's on somebody else's bees at first. And then you go home. And hopefully you've got enough confidence to get it knocked out. Yep. And it's a great time to ask a bunch of questions too. All right. Yeah. Yep. Well, uh, are there any last things that you want to share when it comes to insects, honeybees, and the role of the ecosystem? Yes, definitely. Um, the Probably the biggest thing is, you know, I'm an educator. So the future is our future, right? So the young generation is the future always. Education is always the tool that we guide our pathways in. Uh, whoever is in power now is going to switch and it's going to switch with a new generation. And I don't want to lean left or right or anything, but understand that the, the, the young minds growing up today are different. Uh, they're very different. And the world that they're coming into is very different. The change that has occurred in the last 50 years compared to any other 50 year period is faster, quicker than any, any other time in human history. And then the last thing is, we, we live in a natural world where we are partners in relationships with other organisms. And as a scientist, you know, I, I strive to be objective. So when I say this statement, it hurts me to say it. But at the same time, I'm being extremely objective. And again, the next generation, we need to help them understand what this world is really about. This next generation that is coming out is the most disconnected from nature in the history of humanity. And if we want to continue to have beautiful trees and butterflies and birds and places to hike, we need to do something different than what we're doing now. And we need to teach those young minds that the bees are important, that the mushrooms are important, and everything out there has a purpose and it has a relationship with everything else out there. And that includes us. We are one of but many, roughly 2 million described species. Yep. Amen to that. I remember growing up and catching ants and throwing them into uh, spider webs just to watch what would happen and, you know, getting outside, getting your hands dirty. And now it seems like uh, this generation, they're so engrossed with technology, their phones, whatever it is, and they don't get outside ever. Yeah. Technology is great. I mean, I'm, I love technology. I'm a video gamer. I watch a lot of YouTube, but I, in the back of my mind, I know that there's nothing that a YouTube video can show me in any detail that is going to be more detailed than the real thing. Yep. I agree. Well, what is your vision of what a healthy planet looks like? And what are three things we as a species can do to reach that vision? Oh man, healthy ecosystems would be a number one goal. Uh, visit the national parks. We can have that world. We can have that world everywhere if we want it. Three things I would say as we move into the next decade and century, number one would be less, less pollution, less habitat destruction, less of new buildings and construction and all that. Um, so that's, I think that's really key. Uh, 
habitat loss is a huge, huge problem, not just for the things that live there, but the ecosystem service that are provided. Uh, number two, take time to just immerse yourself. Stop, listen to the birds, feel the wind breathe across your face, dip your toes into cold water and warm water, hike up to some snow and some ice. Understand that those are harsh conditions, but life can still thrive there. You can thrive there. And then from the wellness point of view, for sure, we as individuals live in a world where, where there's more people than ever in human history, but for some reason we feel more disconnected. We're harder on ourselves because we look at Instagram posts and everything's beautiful and they're not as beautiful in our lives, but your life is beautiful. And it's more beautiful when you trust yourself. It's more beautiful when you take care of yourself and it's more beautiful when you allow yourself to express yourself. And so be comforted by the fact that there have been generations in every country that have dealt with war and famine and disease, and they all push through. And we can overcome individually the societies that we don't agree with. We can overcome our prejudices. We can overcome our faults. And moving forward and trusting yourself is the ultimate, ultimate respect to the planet. Because when you trust yourself and you understand your relationship with other organisms, you are just another species. You're the same as the beetle. You're the same as the fungus. You have, a ca you have a task, you have a goal, you have an effect, and you have a way to contribute. Awesome, Danny. You're very well spoken. I appreciate that. Well, where can people find you and um, where can they learn more about some of the classes that you put on? We've got a website. It's called Green River College Honeybees through Facebook. Um, that's probably the best place, easiest to reach me. Um, I am a professor at Green River College, so email at uh, D-N-A-J-E-R-A, -E that's first initial last name, at greenriver.edu. Um, we do all sorts of amazing things. We do nature walks. So you can find me out in the woods, but there's a lot of woods. So um, that's where I am most of the time. And it's funny with this new COVID world and people being remote, I do a lot of my division meetings out on the trail. So um everyone's always like, where's Danny today? And there's trees in the background and all that fun stuff. So get out, immerse yourself, take time to smell the roses, right? It's an old quote and it's an old quote for a reason. So that's what we like to do. Awesome, Danny. Well, thank you so much for coming onto the show and just sharing how uh, insects, honeybees, all that uh, feeds into a healthy ecosystem. I totally appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much. No problem. Great to be here. Thanks. I told you this episode had lots of good information to learn. And if you are interested in raising honeybees, don't be afraid to jump in and try it out. You'll learn a lot in the process and you'll get a nice treat out of it as well. Also, if you want to see all the mistakes and successes I had last year with raising my own bees, if you go to my YouTube channel, summitforwellness.com slash YouTube, I have a bunch of videos there that show the entire process that I went through with my own beehives all the way from the very beginning to harvesting honey. And I was able to get 104 pounds of honey total for last season. So you can go to summitforwellness.com slash YouTube to see those videos. And always get in contact with local bee clubs to learn more and find out good ways to start in your own area. Next week, we have Phoebe Lapine on the show. Let's go learn who she is. Uh, what is one unique thing about you that most people don't know? I hate oranges. I have like a phobia of oranges. Why? I don't know. Just this, they smell horrible to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't like them, but that's because of a uh, young teenager uh, drinking situations. But other than that, I don't mind the oranges. <laughs> that's like probably the only time I ever drank orange juice in my life was in a, you know, a desperate college situation. Yep. <laughs> yep, a screwdriver or a five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what will we be learning about in our interview together? We're going to be talking about small intestine bacterial overgrowth, which sounds, you know, kind of niche and nerdy, but actually affects a lot of people. If you're bloated you, all the time or ever, you'll want to listen to this episode. And what are your favorite foods or nutrients that you think everyone should get more of in their diet? Ooh, I am a big fan of fresh ginger and turmeric and also fresh lemon juice. Um, I think, yeah, drinking a little lemon water in the morning, I'm a big fan of. And yeah. And what are your top three health tips for anyone who wants to improve their overall wellness? 
I would say stress management, um, which could be different for everyone, but I think stress is just the most underrated root cause of a lot of different um, ailments in the body. And it certainly has a huge impact on your digestion. It's always good to talk about some gut stuff and figuring out what is causing it. So until next week, keep climbing to the peak of your health.